Good evening. It's good to be back with you tonight. I have looked forward to this all day. I'm just so excited just not only to, to teach God's Word again, that's always exciting, but to be with you. Uh, you made a great impression yesterday. This is a warm and friendly and loving uh, group of God's people and it's just been a joy to be with you. Your worship is so heartfelt and uh, the fellowship that we've shared with you so far has been appreciated and we just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for being God's people and thank you for welcoming us in as part of His family. God's family, the church, and our responsibility to it is our theme this week. So we began with an introductory lesson in Bible class yesterday morning about the two natures that we can choose. We can choose to approach the study of God's Word from a fleshly perspective based on our desires, what we want, how we would like for things to go, or we can pursue it from a spiritual, a God-led point of view. And that's a very different point of view, isn't it? That's the point of view where whatever God has to say to us in His Word, we accept it, we embrace it, we obey it. We talked yesterday morning in the worship hour about Church 101. Some of the basic, foundational, fundamental aspects of the church, how far uh, the religious world has gotten away from the actual definition of the Lord's church as it's found in the New Testament, and, and our duty to the Lord's church. We talked about that briefly. Last night we went to Acts chapter 2 and we looked at a transition that a group of religious people made from religion to Christianity. They made a transition. It was very difficult for them. They were giving up in many ways everything that had come to represent their livelihood, their lives. They were Jews. They lived in the synagogue. The synagogue was not just the place they went. It was their community. And by accepting Christ as the Messiah, it was no small thing for this group of Jews to do this, was it? You and I all know what this would lead to. In the city of Jerusalem, just a couple of years later, maybe a few years later, it would lead to violent, aggressive persecution against anyone who would name the name of Christ. And so these people who were baptized in Acts chapter 2 that we watched last night, they, they switched from a group of religious people to a group of receptive people and finally a group of repentant people who gave their lives to Jesus in what can only be called the best decision that anybody will ever make, right? That's what happened last night. That was the transition from religion to Christianity. Tonight we follow this same group of people in two different transitions that happened after this first transition. I would invite you to turn back to Acts chapter 2. This group of people, if we're talking about the church, the Lord's church and our responsibility to it, I can think of no better place to be than with the very first group of people who called themselves the Lord's church. Let's stick with them for a few more verses. And let's look at some things. Before we get into this study, the story is told of a young man who won a ticket to the Super Bowl. Anybody care about the Super Bowl? I don't care about the Super Bowl, but from what I understand, a lot of people care about the Super Bowl. And this young man got a free ticket to the Super Bowl. He was very excited. Got dressed up with his, you know, his jersey and his face paint and all these things. He was going to go enjoy the game. It was just one ticket. When he got there, he realized he was in the very back of the stadium and he could barely see what was happening. So he, his excitement began to lessen. He decided, though, that as it got closer to game time, he was going to walk towards the front and see if there were any empty seats that he might take, borrow, whatever you want to say. So he kept walking and kept looking, and he spotted an empty seat on the very front row. And he thought, there's no way that this seat is empty. But he decided, well, what's, what's there to lose? Let's go up here and let's see what's going on. And as he got closer, he approached the man that was sitting next to this empty seat. It was an elderly gentleman. And he said, is this seat taken? The man said, no. And the guy said, how could someone pass up a seat like this? And the older gentleman responded, well, that's my wife's seat. We've been to every Super Bowl together since the day we were married. But she's passed away. And the man was shocked and taken aback and said, well, that's so sad. I'm sorry to hear that. 
Didn't you have a relative or a loved one who wanted to come to the game? He said, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> I was shocked when I thought, that, isn't that a shocking joke? Don't you just want to slap this guy? Don't you just want to say, what are you doing at the football game? What's wrong with you? I had the same, I put my hand to my mouth too. When I read the joke, I thought, should I tell this? But it was so perfect for tonight's lesson because I want to talk for a few minutes tonight about commitment and devotion. We all are committed and devoted to something, aren't we? Sometimes it's something as silly as a game where grown men dress up, throw around a ball, get paid more money than you and I will ever see in our lifetime. But I want to talk about the devotion, first of all, of these members of the Lord's church in Acts chapter 2. And I just want to begin by looking at verse number 42. And I want to talk about the transition, transition number two, from routine to lifestyle. The transition, the second transition of this meeting, from routine to lifestyle. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between the things that you just have found yourself doing over and over and over and the things that you really live to do? There's a difference between those two things. Let's look at verse 42 and let's see what we learn. And they devoted themselves. They is the group of people who was baptized. Just one verse earlier. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So I want to begin by focusing on the phrase, they devoted themselves. The phrase is also translated, depending on which Bible you're reading from, continually devoting themselves. Your Bible may say that. It's from a Greek word that means the following. It means to persist in something. To busy oneself with. To be busily engaged in. It also means to adhere. To be an adherent. To be devoted or constant to one. To be steadfastly attentive to. To give unremitting care to a thing. To persevere and not to faint. To show oneself courageous for. To be in constant readiness for one or to wait on constantly. In other words, whatever it is that this group of people is devoted to, it's not an afterthought, is it? It's not something that they tack on to the end of their day or the end of their week and say, well, I guess we better do this too. This is what they live for. This is what they are all about. Now we could list a lot of, of examples of devotion, couldn't we? I mean, the guy that we talked about at the Super Bowl is a bad example of, of devotion. Let me give you another example. I could list athletes, I could list musicians, but I'm going to talk about a guy named Don Gorski. Anybody know who Don Gorski is? If you do, you're, you're just as weird as he is, okay? So be thankful that you don't know who Don Gorski is. Let me tell you about this guy. He was born November 28, 1953. He holds a Guinness Book of World's Records for the strangest thing you can possibly think of. He is known as the Big Mac Enthusiast. The Big Mac Enthusiast. The Big Mac, according to Don, constitutes 90 to 95% of his total solid food intake every day. Gorski claims that after getting his first car, the first place he went was McDonald's, May 17, 1972. He bought three Big Macs at lunchtime, returned two more times that day to consume a total of nine Big Macs on the same day that he discovered the burger. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> he further claims to have eaten 265 Big Macs in the following month. An average of 8.5 Big Macs per day. This is the equivalent to 4,600 calories, 247 grams of low quality fat daily. For a total, prepare yourself of 143,100 calories and 16.9 pounds of fat in one month. He also claims proudly, for some reason, to drink almost nothing but Coca-Cola. 
He met and proposed to his wife, Mary, bless her heart, at a McDonald's. What a special occasion that must have been. In 1975, he also has a statue of Ronald McDonald in his yard. And by this point, you're probably not surprised. Here's what might surprise you. He's six foot two inches, exactly my height, and weighs 185 pounds, which is less than what I weigh. Now you're surprised, aren't you? This is the amazing part of this. His cholesterol is 140. 140. I would kill one of y'all to have a cholesterol of 140. It's well below the average of 208. Do you know that May 4th of this year, May 4th of this year, Don Gorski ate his 30,000th Big Mac. I have never eaten 30,000 of anything. Have you? Maybe I have. M&M's, something like that. But it's probably unlikely that any of us have ever heard of someone so devoted to a sandwich. So devoted to a sandwich. So Don Gorski is, everything we just said about the definition of devotion describes him and his feelings toward the Big Mac. So, when we get to the Christians of Acts chapter 2, hopefully, we're not talking about a sandwich when we talk about their devotion. But what are we talking about? Go back to that verse. And let's just see, what is it that they feel this tied to? What is it they feel this strongly and this passionate and this excited about? Well, the first thing that it says is the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. Remember, this is a long time before you and I would ever have our New Testament, right? They don't have a New Testament. It's not even been written at this point. It's not been inspired, it's not been collected, it's not been distributed. The blueprint for the early church came straight from these 12 men, didn't it? They were miraculously inspired, and almost literally when they stood up to talk, it was God speaking directly to His people. These men were more than just their preachers. These men were the Word of God in human personification in so many words. These were their preachers. This would have been a full-time job. Acts chapter 6, we see that there were some problems in the church. Some of the Grecian widows weren't getting fed and it brought to the apostles' attention. And what did they say? We don't have time for this. Find some men among you who can take this job and see to this problem. We do not have time to leave the Word of God and wait on tables. This was an important job. But let me ask you a question. What if Peter's particular personality, and he had one by the way, rubbed you the wrong way? Can you imagine anybody walking out of Sunday service in the first century? Can you believe that, Peter? The the nerve of him to say that. I just don't like him. I, I don't even understand how he got this job. Do we really have to listen to what he says? It's kind of like you probably can imagine this this very human, very natural approach to Peter that some people probably took, right? I just don't like him. You ever felt that way about a preacher? Hopefully not Sean, but you ever felt that way? I just don't don't want to listen to him anymore. His personality is getting in the way. Or maybe you're one of the Jews that thought, is Matthew speaking this week? No, I'm staying at home. I don't care what you say, he used to be a tax collector and I cannot get over it. I'm sorry, let me know when his turn is over and we rotate back around to James. You can imagine, these were men. Their their preaching was perfect. But do you think their lives were? Think their personalities were? No. But the people were devoted to their teaching. Because they knew what it was. Now what would that mean? If you were going to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, what would that mean? Well, I think it means it would take some of your time, don't you think? Hey, one of the apostles, there's, by the way, there's 12 of them and there's 3,000 of us. So the 3,000 are going to have to rotate around the schedule of the 12, right? 
So you're going to take some time. If one of the apostles is teaching today, I probably need to make some time in my schedule and need to go listen to what he has to say. might take some effort. There's no PA system. There's no podcast. There's no books that they have written. Well, I'll just read the book and I'll stay home. You've got to go to them. You've got to have some respect for these men. I need to put my personal issues with them aside if I have any. And I need to let their message soak into my heart. I need to have some perspective, in other words. Like, this is going to take some sacrifices in order for me to be devoted to what these 12 men have to say on a daily basis, but I need to do it because this is God's Word. And I want to be so connected to it that whatever it takes, I'll be there. I can imagine that, that no one in this group of 3,000 ever really said the words, ah, I just don't want to go listen to them today. They were devoted. Devoted people don't make excuses. They make sacrifices. They're also devoted to the fellowship. This is the Greek word koinonia. It means fellowship, association, community, communion, joint participation. The share which one has in anything and intimacy. Another Greek definition calls it close association involving mutual interests and sharing. We're going to see this expressed in verse 44 in just a few minutes. But for now... It's enough to understand they are continuously devoting themselves to each other. Continuously. Now we take the word fellowship and we do something really clever with it. We're going to have ourselves a fellowship meal. We're going to have an event and we're going to just take care of this fellowship thing over some roast beef. And maybe a pie. And and when it's over... Hey, wasn't that a wonderful fellowship? Don't we look forward to the next fellowship meal, which hopefully will be next week? That's what we have done in a lot of ways with fellowship. We have turned it into an event that can be gone to and left. That's not what they did. They were devoted to the fellowship, the community that they have with one another. So that means they didn't wait to spend time with each other for somebody to to provide a meal. They didn't wait for that. Eating was part of what they did together, and we'll see that in just a few minutes. But they lived their lives with one another. This is a lifestyle that you and I are either involved in or we're not. The fellowship that the early Christians were devoted to was not a come-and-go-as-you-please kind of relationship, was it? In fact... If anyone did come and go as they pleased, they weren't numbered with this group of people. Because they were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted also to the breaking of bread. This phrase can either be a reference to the Lord's Supper, as in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, or to a common meal, as we see in verse 46 of this same chapter. In the immediate context, it probably talks about the Lord's Supper. Everything mentioned in verse 42 seems to to have some connection to corporate or assembly worship. Most people will agree that this is probably a reference to the Lord's Supper. But if they're continually devoting themselves to taking the Lord's Supper together, how many Sundays do you think they missed? Probably not any that they didn't have to. It was incredibly important. It was the, the focal point in some ways of their week. Look forward to this. This is what brought us together in the first place. Let's make this a priority. Let's not rush through it. Let's not be thinking about other things while we're thinking about this. Then they're devoted to the prayers. This is pretty self-explanatory. This is a group of people continually devoting themselves to prayer. Can you picture them praying quick, routine prayers? Can you picture anyone standing around in the foyer in the first century? That prayer was 4 minutes and 28 seconds. I timed it on my iPhone. If that guy gets up again, I'm going to the bathroom. And I'll be back before he says amen. Nobody will even know it. Can you imagine that in the first century? No way! They were devoted to the prayers. They believed in it. They didn't just have a guy stand up and lead a prayer because, well, I guess we've got to have an opening prayer, closing prayer. Anything, do we need to pray any more than that? No, we got it covered. We'll open with it, we'll close with it. 
And that'll be enough. No, they prayed constantly. How much do we pray as a group of people? I mean, if I was to ask you, what do you do when someone's leading a prayer? You might think, well, that's an easy answer, but is it? I could tell you that, that this evening, this very evening during the prayer, it wasn't really my fault, but I was trying to keep my son from walking up to the front. <laughs> And I'm going to have to make up for that later. I, I didn't get to pray with you, really, honestly. I, I was distracted. How many times does that happen? Devoted to prayer. I want you to see this devotion, this transition from routine, well, we've got to go to the feast again. Kill another lamb. How much is that going to cost? We're going from the routine of religion to a lifestyle of devotion. Do you see it? In one verse. That's not the only transition. Let's talk about the third transition they, they make here in these next few verses. Verses 43 through 47. This is amazing stuff here. I hope you're not so familiar with this that, that it's just kind of going in one ear and out the other. This is an amazing example of a church. Listen very closely to these next few verses. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to talk about a direction. We talked about a decision last night. We just talked about a devotion. Let's talk about a direction in these verses. A transition from stagnant to dynamic. From stagnant to dynamic. What did their devotion to the four things we just looked at, what did it cause? You might think devotion is an end in and of itself. Well, I just need to be devoted and that'll be what I need to do. No, no, no. Devotion, true devotion, leads to things, doesn't it? It certainly did for this group of people. What did their lives look at, look like as a result of this devotion? Let me give you a few things. They all start with the letter F. If you like to take notes, this was what they taught us in school. It all has to start with the same letter. So here we go. I want to start with their feeling. What does it say in the verse? All, all, A-W-E, came upon every soul. This word in this context means reverence and profound respect. And it is in reference to what is happening among them. What's happening among them? Wonders and signs are being done through the apostles. God is moving and working within this group of people. And the feeling is something that is palpable. Everyone is in awe. Look what God is doing among us. This is amazing. There's no lukewarmness. There's no laziness. There's no apathy. There's no distraction or any such feeling. They can't believe. They are amazed at what God is doing among them. Are you? Are you? Is there a feeling of awe when you come together? That, oh, man, look what God is doing among us. Look what God is doing in, in this life over here, in this family over here, in, in this neighbor, neighbor over here that I've been talking to. Boy, this is just amazing. Is it possible, if that's not something that we feel, is it possible that we're not devoted enough to it? If the feeling hasn't come, if we're, if we're just kind of stagnant, routine, is it possible that it's because we're just simply not devoted enough to it? You usually don't get much out of things that you're not putting much into them, don't you? That's why I don't go to the Super Bowl, because I don't care. If I go to the Super Bowl, I'm going to be complaining to you about how much it costs when I get out. $13 hot dog, are you kidding me? How, did you realize how much I had to pay just to sit and be bored for four hours? I would rather be home watching the commercials. 
That's probably how a lot of you feel about a lot of things, right? If you feel that way about the church, then it's not the church's problem. It's not the church's fault, is it? I'm not going to get much out of something that I have not decided to be committed to. If it's not what I'm all about, it's just kind of a nuisance sometimes. But it's not supposed to be. They have this feeling of amazement and awe. Then they have this fellowship, and we've mentioned it, that they're devoted to it. But how devoted are they to the fellowship? This is where it gets real, isn't it? They are selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had Need. This isn't just people saying that roast beef was delicious. See you next Sunday. Didn't you enjoy that fellowship? That was just amazing. That was so much fun. That's not what's happening here. Hey, did you hear brother so-and-so is in need? They can't, they can't afford to, to stay in Jerusalem much longer. they got three kids. They need some help. Let's sell something and take care of them. That's another level, isn't it? Most people are, are, are willing to fellowship until it costs them something. When it starts costing me something to have fellowship, I don't know if I want to be part of that. They didn't hesitate to put their fellowship and their devotion to their fellowship in action. They're not just hanging around the building if something fun is going on or there's food. This is sacrifice, trust, and compassion. Now, this was something that popped up again in Acts chapter 5, if you remember. Ananias and Sapphira want people to think that they have this feeling, right? Hey, we want them to think that, we, that we're this devoted to the fellowship, but we don't actually want to be this devoted to it. So what did God do to, to show us how He feels about that? Don't fake it. Let me just say that. Don't fake it. You might end up dead by the end of church service. Don't fake it. But if you don't have what they had, and you're not willing to do what they were willing to do for each other, maybe you're not enough. Maybe it doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean to you. Their fellowship. Number three, their frequency. How often did this take place? We're then told day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. What does this mean? The English standard is actually not probably capturing the full meaning of the Greek word that's used here. They're not just meeting together in the same location or building. They are continuing with one mind day by day. They are, they are continuing with one accord, with one passion. They have maintained this momentum day after day after day after day. Whether it's Sunday worship, Bible class in the temple, small group get-togethers in people's homes. The early church was spending time together on a daily basis. There it is. I didn't say it. God did. This is the same word that's used in verse 47. We know exactly what it means. And it would be accurate to say if you weren't doing this, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to do that. If you weren't doing this, you weren't part of this group. There was no such thing, hear me, as a Sunday morning crowd in the first century. Because if somebody showed up Sunday morning and they hadn't been seeing them all week, they'd probably say, who is that? We need to teach them the gospel. Because they clearly don't get it the way that we do. If they think this is the once a week type situation. It didn't exist then. And I don't see anything in Acts chapter 2 that says, well, uh, James and John had to go out and just drag people to the daily fellowship. Please come. On the fo- James, call so-and-so. They hadn't been here in six weeks. Call them and remind them how important it is. I don't see any of that. This is amazing, isn't it? I've never seen anything like this in my life. Have you? People act, some people who only come on Sunday morning, they act like, here I am. Aren't you glad? Check it out. I'm here. I made it. My pleasure. You're welcome. As if that's what it's supposed to look like. God is saying, listen, if you're not devoted enough to want to spend more time with each other than that, you don't get it. You don't get my family and your responsibility to it. Here's what it looks like. Everything that's happened since this is watered down and simply not as much 
as it used to be and not as much as it should be. Am I saying everybody needs to quit their job so we can all hang out every day? No. Please don't do that and don't say that I said that. But we're talking about a much more consistent fellowship than some of us are used to, aren't we? Some of us literally walk out the back door, well, we'll see you next Sunday. And, and we never cross paths. Now we're lucky enough, fortunate enough, if we can cross paths digitally, can't we? On the phone. Even if you can't physically see somebody, we live in a blessed time where you can cross paths any number of ways to encourage each other and spend time together. But are we doing it? Their frequency was day by day. They were always together. Next, we talk about their food. We finally do get to some food here. Eating was not taken for granted. It was another activity that took place in community. One writer put it this way. I thought this was a beautifully accurate statement. They had been plucked from the very fires of hell by the grace of God and joy filled their hearts. And it was natural to gravitate to others filled with the same joy. It would have been unnatural to do otherwise. They did not merely endure one another. They enjoyed one another. Do you enjoy being with your church family? It says they ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Isn't that amazing? We did that Sunday morning at Arby's. Can you believe that? (coughs) We had a table full of kids. There must have been 35 of them. (laughs) Felt like it. Several adults, I know everybody couldn't make it, we all couldn't fit in Arby's probably, but here we are at Arby's of all places, you know, acting like Don Gorski, filling our bodies with stuff that's probably not good for it, just enjoying one another. I wish we could stay there for hours. That's what we're supposed to do. We have something in common that transcends curly fries. We have something in common that brings us together, that if we are together, it should be fun. It should be enjoyable. Tell me about how you came to learn about the Lord. Tell me about how your walk is going. Encourage me with something that's going on in your life. That's what they did. They understood the gift that God had given them. They appreciated one another. They didn't take anything for granted. And they did this with the purpose, verse 47, of praising God. When's the last time you just let yourself enjoy being with other Christians? Just enjoyed it. We are the last people to leave the Buford Church of Christ building. And let me tell you something, on Wednesday nights, that means that our kids get to bed an hour and a half after they're supposed to. You know why we do that? Because the most important thing we want to teach them is church is not an afterthought. These people are not just part of our lives, these people are our lives. We love them. We don't rush away from them. We don't have anything more important to do. And they love the church. But that's not an accident, is it? When's the last time you just enjoyed being with the church? Plan on enjoying God's people the way that these people did. Their food. Something as simple as a meal. Go to Arby's. Their favor. Listen to the evidence of this. Evidently, this kind of devotion and direction was quite popular among the larger community of Jerusalem. They were having favor with who? Isn't this amazing? Having favor with all the people. Which is the word that's usually translated grace. That word favor is usually translated grace. In this context, it means goodwill. And doesn't it make sense? That if these people were living in your town and a group of people actually lived their lives like this, there'd be no reason for anybody not to like them, would there? There'd be no reason for anybody to look down on them, criticize them, speak evil of them. But is this how people look at us now? I know we live in a different time. Trust me, I know. But when people look at us, when people look at the Lord's church, do we find favor? Do people say, well, look how they love each other. They are in Arby's every single Sunday just sitting back there cutting up and laughing and those kids are making a mess and they cleaned it up and it's just amazing what's going on. They had favor with all the people. And then you see the fruit. They had goodwill with their surrounding community and the body of people 
grew. Now, where was the evangelistic campaign? Where, where is Peter saying, now listen everybody, we're going to have a seminar on evangelism and get out there and do what you're supposed to do. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, people, let's get to it. It didn't seem like anybody had to tell them, you need to be talking to your neighbors about the gospel. It just happened. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Their daily devotion, their daily direction had led to daily growth. People wanted to be a part of that. What would happen with the church now if we took the same approach? If we made the decision to transition from religion to Christianity, if we had the same devotion that, that caused us to make the transition from routine to a lifestyle, and if we had the direction in life as a church that, w- that went beyond stagnant and, and became dynamic and had meaning and purpose, If this is not what our lives look like, then maybe we're not fulfilling our responsibility to God's family. See, it goes beyond beliefs, doesn't it? It goes beyond being able to say to your neighbor and your co-worker, well, this is where I go to church. It goes past that. If I'm reading any of this right, being part of the Lord's church changes your life and changes the life of everybody that you're around. The power, can you you see this with me? The power of this passage is almost overwhelming. Do you agree that if we could get back to this, that we wouldn't be having a lot of the problems we're having? Can you, can I get back to this? We are quick to say, and I think we should say it, that we trace our beliefs and our origin and our roots all the way back to Acts chapter 2. Don't we say that? Could anyone trace our lifestyle if they were to look at it on social media, if they were to follow us around with a camera for two weeks? Could anybody trace our lifestyle back to these people? Or would they say, you seem a little busy, a little too busy for any of the stuff that you say is important to you. That steps on my toes, if I could be honest. That steps on my toes. Power of a single passage. No escaping the powerful truth of what our responsibility is toward the Lord's church. No escaping what it's supposed to look like practically. And there's really no escaping the the tremendous sacrifice that it's going to take to make that happen, is there? I want to encourage you tonight, as I have been encouraged by this study, take a step towards this kind of devotion. Take a step in this direction. We all need to. Could we just, I mean, the front row should be filled tonight, theoretically, of people who say, hey, I need to do better. Why don't we all just pretend we're there tonight? How about that? And let's just pray for one another. And let's just put our arms around one another. And let's just try to be the people we say we are. God has a family. Don't you think that's an important part of this theme? God's family. Let me tell you what my family's going to do tonight. <clears throat> At some point, we'll run all these little kids out of this building. We'll put them in this busted up minivan. And on the way home, we'll probably play a game where we try to guess Bible characters. And when we get home to the house that doesn't, doesn't even belong to us, we'll pile into it and we'll get them into their pajamas and we'll say some prayers and probably sing a song or two and, and talk about the Bible on some level, and they'll want to do it. And we'll hug them and we'll kiss them and we'll tell each other that we love each other and we'll go to bed and we'll get up tomorrow and we'll do it all over again because we're family. At no point will I say to one of my children, I love you, see you next week. I I love you more than anything, see you next week. Never. Because they're family. God has a family. That's what He's called it. He calls Himself a father. He calls us His children. Let's act more like it. Myself included. Tonight, the Lord's invitation is open. And I know that most of us here tonight are probably already part of this group of people that calls themselves Christians. I know that. But it's a matter of tradition and convenience for you if you're not part of that family. I don't know you very well. Maybe you're not. 
part of God's family and you want to be. If you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that He came down from heaven, that He lived a perfect life and died on a cross for your sins, if you believe that, and you're willing to confess Him before others and you're willing to turn from your life of sin, be buried with Him in baptism for forgiveness of those sins, then you can be part of the family tonight. If you're a wandering member of God's family in any way, you haven't been devoted enough or committed enough, and you want to come back home, I believe that there will be somebody waiting for you. I know God will be. But I believe there will be somebody waiting here for you tonight that will welcome you back. They might even invite you to Arby's if you're lucky. So if you have a spiritual need, don't leave here tonight without having it met. If there's anything we 